Okay, I just want to expound on what he just said. I don't know if um, you can sit down if you want for a moment. Um, I don't know if you know that throughout the Word of God, when God reveals his names, he revealed them when it was a necessary time to give someone a larger picture of himself. And so that my father will see to it comes from the name Jehovah Jireh. The reason why and when that name appeared in the word of God was when Abraham was willing to walk his child, his promise up the mountain and lay him on a bed of sticks to put them on fire to consume him. But Abraham had grown up in God enough by this time. There was a problem that Abraham had in his life and the problem that he had was that he wasn't willing to let go of his family. The Lord told him to go into a place that he didn't know he was willing to do that, but he said, don't take anybody with you except for your family, the, your immediate family. And he took his nephew, Lot, which was nothing but problems after that. Then when he was in Egypt, he told everybody he lied about who his wife was. That happened twice. So he wasn't willing to give up. The very last Thing, the stronghold that the enemy had on Abraham's life was that he had to be willing to give the most precious commodity that he had, and that was his son, his promised son. And so, but if you think about how that scenario went, Abraham and his son Isaac walked up that mountain together. He was a teenager by that time. I mean, he wasn't some little kid. I don't know how they picture it in all the pictures, but he wasn't a baby. He wasn't a toddler. He was old enough to walk up the mountain. He was, he was old enough to understand when he said, but Father, where is the lamb to be sacrificed? That there was nobody there but him and Abraham. <laughs> and Abraham said, by faith, that even if he slays him, he will raise him up again. And so when he laid his son down, his promise down, I don't know how many of you have a promise and you're holding on to it and you're trying to stronghold God into making it come to pass. You're going to make sure that God is going to do it. And that's why we keep saying that it's up to the Father and that the Father will see to it. And when he finally laid his son down and he was willing to release it, God showed up as Jehovah Jireh, his provider. My Father will see to it. And in that moment, Abraham got a huge blown out picture of how awesome his father was, that he would never leave him without providing what he needed. You need to get that picture in your mind today. I don't know what you have need of. I don't know what God is asking you to give, but I know this, you can't outgive God. Because every single time that you give to him, he takes it and he makes it majestic in return. He will take whatever you offer to him and he will multiply it back to you. He will take the, the littlest things and he will take the biggest things. And he will add his anointing and his power to it. And it will be an explosion in your life. And I believe this is a word for someone today because there is a tendency that when things get tough, we start holding on. We start holding on to everything that we have. We start holding on to the little things. We hold on to the big things. We, we just forget that our father is a father we can trust. We just forget his nature, that he is a giver. We just forget that whatever we give to him, he will give back. He is not trying to steal from you. He is trying to get things to you. 
but he will get to you when you are willing to give everything that you have to him. And I am, I, I mean, it includes money, so I'm not going to apologize for saying it includes money because that's how you get increase in money you get back what you give but i am talking about your time your talent your energy and your finances i'm talking about what you do in your everyday life that you offer up to him with an expectancy that your father will see to it and so when when i have that in my office at home i have it well jane had it made for me and it's in my office at home because I need to be reminded every day that my father is a good God. He's, he's my father, but he's also God. There is nothing too difficult for him. So whatever you're struggling with today, whatever you have need of today, we have declared it, we have decreed it, and now you have to believe it. And I, I, I think it would behoove you to take action on that. Whatever you can give today, whether it be your time, your talent, your energy, or your finances, make sure that you are a giver. Your heart has to be like his. He's a giver. That's the way he is. And that's the way he designed you to be. So don't hold on to things that have no worth, no value. Let them go so he can multiply back what you have need of. So if you're holding on, I just feel like somebody may be holding on to unforgiveness. Well, man, just walk that thing up to the altar right now. You know what you get when you give him unforgiveness? You get forgiveness. <laughs> you know, it, it's one of the things that hangs you up on the inside. It's one of those things you can't explain. But when you give your unforgiveness to God, all of a sudden you're free and forgiveness reigns over your life. Let's just do that right now. Father God, I, I believe that you directed that. And God, I believe that there is unforgiveness in people's hearts right now. And, and Lord, we've all been there. So Lord, we are not... We are not accusing anyone. We're just flowing with you today. And Lord, I thank you that we have the ability to walk that up the mountain and lay it on the altar. So we do it, Lord, right now. Step by step, knowing that what you will resurrect, Lord, will be the answer to our hearts hurt that you will bring healing Lord and you will bring freedom so Lord we bring it right now if you see a name if you feel if you know what your what your hang up is lay it on the altar we thank you Jesus for that and we thank you that you are coming to consume. You're consuming us in your love. You're not consuming anything else. You're consuming, Lord, what we need to offer to you. But you're giving back even more. Father, every promise, Lord, that we are trying to strong arm you with, we release it to you. And we trust that you're seeing to it. You're, you're seeing to every aspect of our life. We thank you for bringing it into divine order right now. In your precious name, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. All the strategies of man, they just don't work when it comes to things that, that the enemy has tied you up with. The only thing that can free you is giving all of everything to him. And then he gives all that he is to you. It's the great exchange. It's beautiful. Amen? Amen. What you saying? <laughs>
Would you do the offering? <laughs> Sorry. everyone the the Lord's presence is very it's very tender this morning I think and it's uh it's really it's beautiful thank you Lord thank you Lord <clears throat> all right would you join me in making our scripture and reading our scripture and making our declaration our scripture is Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2 ready Let's read it together. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And our declaration, Father, we praise you for establishing your kingdom on the earth high above all other kingdoms. We ask for you to have your way in our president, the leaders of our nation, and in all decision makers throughout the world. Rising and establishing your house in this nation, and all nations shall flow to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, quickly, our announcements. Um, first of all, let me say that in your bulletin, you will find... Uh, listed the holiday schedule because you know in December it's Liberty we have a lot going on so all those things are in your bulletin and I um, uh, I'll touch on them briefly but if you, you want to keep the bulletin with you so that you can know for sure what's happening in the as this month progresses okay this week uh, on Tuesday from 6 to 7 we have our all-out prayer and then from 7 to 8, we have our multi-church prayer. And both of those events are on the phone. And then Friday, from 10 to 12, we have our family prayer here at the church. And Wednesday, our prophetic training class is continuing again this week. Um, uh, the youth and young adults are invited to that. And listen, this is, that's, a great, that's a great time we have together on Wednesday nights. Our Friday Limitless Youth are meeting this week, and they are having their Christmas party this week. Okay, so Friday, December 6th, the Limitless Youth from 7 to 11. And you can see there, youth, take a picture of that so you can um, keep it for yourselves and know that you are bringing $6 for a secret Santa and a bus trip to Five Below. Hey, that's pretty good. You get to keep a dollar of your six dollars. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, because five below, you get everything you get there is for exactly. All right. So sign up, bring a finger food, youth, and uh, or a dessert for everybody to share together. All right. Or get your mom or dad to make it for you. The finger food or the dessert. All right. On Sunday, December 15th, the King's Men will be meeting, and there will be more details about that meeting uh, coming up. Uh, just pay attention to the, um, I suppose, the announcement next week. All right? Um, already covered the youth. The young adults are meeting this Saturday. 
okay, at 6 p.m. at Ryan and Edie's house, okay? Everyone clear on that? Ryan and Edie, are you, are you back in the room? Okay, if you want directions to Ryan and Edie, Ryan and Edie's house, see Ryan or Edie, all right? And then the young adults are having a Christmas party on December 14th. And that will be at Justin and Rachel's house. And I think Justin is in with the kids. And I'm sure Rachel is with her babies. So um, if you want directions on that, see Justin and Rachel after church. Okay? Sunday, December 15th, the ladies' Christmas party is going to be at Edie and Ryan's house again. Okay, so Edie and Ryan are going to be very busy over the next couple of weeks. With people, with people crashing at their house, all right? And Justin and Rachel, apparently, okay? Um, Sunday, December 22, is our Christmas brunch service, okay? And that's at 10 a.m., so that's going to be our regular Sunday service, and we're going to celebrate Christmas all together that day. It's going to be, we're going to have a good time, all right? And then Tuesday... December 31st is our New Year's Eve service, and that's going to be from 8 to 10 here at the church, and everyone should bring a dessert to that. Okay, so we, you know, we got to eat. <laughs> right. We don't get enough to eat. <laughs> All right. For our offering, I'm just going to sort of tag team with what Pastor Don already mentioned um, uh, regarding the offering, but I wanted to read the scripture to you. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. And it reads as this. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So I just want to ask you this morning, what do you do when you're confronted with the truth of Scripture that's different? than your behavior or your your current circumstances disagrees with or is in opposition to? Do you change the way you are? Do you allow change to take place in your own life? Or do you insist on having your own way and just tear that page out of your Bible? Yeah, I mean, so, so listen... The Lord loves a cheerful giver. So, you know, I get pretty cheerful when the Dolphins score a touchdown or when they win a game or two. You know, I get pretty cheerful. I actually get, yeah, two. Two is so far this year. Yeah, exactly. But now, uh, or any of my sports teams. But now, do, I don't really get that cheerful when, I'm, when it's time for me to give my offering. So I need to adjust my behavior. I need, to, I need to be happy, as happy about giving my offering, my tithe and offering every week, as I am about everything else that makes me cheerful, that makes me joyful. It should bring us joy to be able to give our tithes and offerings. So this morning, declare that for your own life. Declare it with me. And ushers, if you'll wait on the people while we declare, that would be perfect. All right. So this morning, repeat after me. This morning, I am declaring that I am giving my tithes and offerings with a joyful heart. I'm a joyful giver. And I am happy to be able to participate. In giving my tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Celebrate. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. I know, it's very rolly. I hope I don't have to sit in it. So, how many of you know we live in a human body? We have the kingdom of God within us, but our human body sometimes is acting up. So I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning with my body acting up. So in case you see, if I have to leave this pulpit, I will. <laughs> but I'll be right back, just warning you. <laughs> but I believe that what we just declared and what we just prayed and what we just worshipped brought healing and wholeness because the kingdom of God is within me and it's manifesting itself Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, now, I don't know why you guys are so subtle and so, I don't know what that is, but I want some happy people in here today. <laughs> we serve a great big God, amen? And he is good. Okay, so I'm talking about the kingdom of God, and I get excited about the kingdom of God. Because when I realized that Jesus took the last 40 days, I mean, we know this, but I've been thinking about it. Why? Of all the subjects he could have talked about, the last 40 days that he was alive on this earth, he only talked about kingdom. And then he talked about kingdom. And then he talked about kingdom for 40 days. I think we might need to understand kingdom a little bit better, don't you? And so if he did that, then that's because they, like most of us, do not live our lives with the kingdom of God at the forefront of our hearts. We don't even understand what it means. How are we going to put it at the forefront of our hearts and our minds? And so we need to, have a, to, we need to live differently. And in order to live differently, we have to have a better understanding. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand, as well as me. So if your understanding of the kingdom isn't bigger than the kingdom of this world, then we can't ascend to kingdom revelation, which is what's going to bring kingdom transformation. Amen? So we have to ascend. We've got to go up. Okay? So last week we talked about how God empowered. He gave us power to the church. We talked about the body being ecclesia, which means the called out ones. And we are called out to be different. Say, I'm called out, I'm called out. to be different. Yeah. So we're going to be the difference for the world in every, every place that we are and every place that we go. So we have to be kingdom-minded as a necessity, and we have to understand that Jesus paid this price for us to experience it. So in our, it is our inheritance through being born again that we have positional authority. And we sang about that this morning. Positional authority. We are sitting... In heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I wish I had a bigger seat now. Okay, so just pretend this is twice as big. Or maybe I'm sitting on Jesus' lap. That'd be okay too. We're sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Now, if you see yourself sitting in this seat, Jesus is right here, the Father's right there. What is it? that can't be done. If you're looking from a heavenly perspective down on the world and there is problems, what can't be accomplished if you understand and recognize where you really are sitting and who you're sitting with. Amen? Okay, so we're sitting in heavenly places and when we start seeing from that perspective, we're going to start living our lives differently. Amen? Amen. But positional authority deals with our relationship with God. It's about how we know him. How do we view him? I mean, so many people come to church and they have a wrong idea of what the father is like. They think he's mean. They think he's judgmental. They think that he's ready to make them a grease spot on the floor. I mean, they're afraid of the father. Most people think Jesus is the good guy. The father is the bad guy. And the Holy Ghost is kind of weird. But once you get to know the Godhead and how they function together, you fall in love with all of them, and then you can trust them all. So you have to have positional authority by relationship with the Father. We could never earn our way into getting that authority. We have to have authority because that is what God gave us. We have to understand what we are walking in. And transitional authority deals with our lifestyle before God. 
So this is where the rubber meets the road. It's that we can say that we have relationship with the Father. But if we have relationship with the Father, our authority transitions from the world's authority into the spirit authority, and we transform our lifestyle to agree with God. Somebody say amen. Okay, so if we're going to be utilized the way God wants us to be utilized, and Listen, I hate when people say, well, Lord, I give you my life, use me. And then whenever God calls on them to do something, they go, uh, you know, I'm all used up. Well, you know, don't be mad at God for, for giving you, granting what you said, but he will not deplete you. He will utilize you and then he'll fill you back up. You don't have to live depleted. You're to live kingdom-mindedness. You're to live in his presence. His presence is what renews you, amen? Okay, so last week we talked about we had the power to flip on the lights and to flip on the switch of the enemy. Do you remember? And so we were flipping on switches. We were getting rid of the enemy, shining the light in the darkness, and we used electricity as our example. So when we got born again, we flipped the switch just like Jesus did on the enemy so that other people could also be partake of the light. But we must understand we can't just have power because power alone is not enough. Power alone is not enough. Because when the kingdom of God is in operation and it has been given to us, it begins from heaven to earth and it empowers us, but it empowers us to move from power into full authority. So we're talking about the authority. You know, Florida Power and Light, ultimately, we can flip all the switches we want to in our house. But Florida Power and Light is the ultimate authority of our electricity. <laughs> Because if they don't power up, it doesn't matter how many times we flip that switch. Is that true? And so we have to understand that we are a territorial church. And what I mean by that is wherever, whoever is in charge of the territory is in charge of what is going to power up or power off. And so when God placed us in Davie, which he did, and he placed us in the city and the surrounding areas, he called us many times through many prophetic words, a territorial church. It just means this. It means that he has given us the authority to rule and reign over what he has given us authority over. This is our territory. Say, this is our territory. And so we operate beyond any demonic authority that thinks that they have this territory because we have kingdom authority and we happen to be God's power and light. So we're not operating from Florida power and light. Now we're operating in the authority of God with his power and with his light. So when, when the kingdom of God is in operation, what has been given to us begins because it comes from heaven to earth, and it empowers us to move from hope to faith. How many of you have some hope for some things right now? Are you hoping for some things? Okay, so hope is the want. Hope is the expectancy that something can be changed, that something can be true. But faith is different, because faith is a firm belief that in God's promises, without need of physical proof. So if you're looking for physical proof, you're operating still in hope, and the kingdom of God is coming to transfer you out of just hope into faith so it becomes substance to you. Once you have the substance that you hope for, you see it whether anybody else sees it or not. You believe it whether anybody else believes it or not. It is settled in your heart. If God said it, then it's yours and you're going to walk in it. Amen? And so the kingdom of God is a transforming power within us that gets us to agree with what God's word has already promised. And so when it becomes valuable to you and you're aware of the kingdom of God on the inside, you begin to pull upon the anointing that is in it and it releases the power to change you from just hoping into actually believing. And when you believe, you receive. Amen? 
Okay, it takes you from ritual to resolution. So even, even us charismatic, on fire Christians can get into rituals. We know the way things are supposed to go. We like the way things, you know, we do the same things almost every day. We like it. We like it. It makes us feel secure. But God is bringing his kingdom, and he's bringing a resolution, and he's bringing a revolution through people who have a revelation. Amen? So when you have a revelation of who he is and what he's done, you begin to get charged up on the inside. You're not satisfied with the way things have always been. Why would we be? Because God is always on the move. God is always expanding his kingdom. He's always expanding his knowledge on the inside of us. Amen? And so we don't just go to church. We are the church. Say, I am the church. Amen. Amen. When the kingdom of God is in operation, then we can go from knowledge to truth. You know, we, we know, in theory, that gravity is real, right? But you don't know the truth of that until you jump off of something or you fall down. Gravity becomes truth to you at that point. And at that point, you start... Stepping away from the edges of very high places. Well, if you have any sense, you do. <laughs> and so you're more cautious up without anything to protect you because gravity will cause you to fall. But when, when, we have, when we switch from knowledge to truth, we are no longer working in just head knowledge, but we have truth on the inside of us that revolutionizes us. Amen. All right, so we have to know what God's kingdom is comprised of and the culture of the kingdom. What does it represent? Okay, so Jesus used parables all the time, which just means stories, to try to explain things that were not easily understood. And so this is one of the things that he talked to his um, disciples about, Mark 4, 30. And he said, what shall we liken the kingdom of God to? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, it is smaller than all the seeds of the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So Jesus is talking to a bunch of people who actually understood mustard seeds because they had them there. But, but I had to look it up. How many of you know what a mustard seed does and what their tree looks like? You do? That's just because you studied to teach it. I know it. It ain't because you just know. Okay, so mustard seeds, I thought this was interesting. They come in different colors. Did you know that? White, yellow, brown, and black. Isn't that nice? Okay, and then the seed, in order to produce a harvest, it has to be sown, just a little bitty seed, sown, but it has to be all of the seed. So the seed can get damaged, the seed can get too dry, the seed could get too wet. If you hold on to it too long and you don't release it when it's time for the harvest, you can ruin the harvest because you didn't release it at the right time. Okay? If it's sown correctly, however, within 30 days of germination, it will develop into a mature canopy that is five to six and a half feet tall. And after another month, it will begin to bud. And then the flowering period lasts 7 to 15 days. And then these pods develop. And, each, and inside each pod, there's 20 to 40 pods on each one of these things. And they'll produce about six seeds. So, you know, I was thinking, well, that doesn't sound like a lot. But one acre of mustard plants can give you one ton of seeds. I know. So they knew in, in Jesus' time, they understood what that looked like. They understood what was being produced. They understood, they, they, they knew that whatever was small when it was sown could be huge in bringing forth the harvest. And so the culture of the kingdom of God is totally opposite than the culture of the world. Because in the culture of the world, first of all, you don't sow. You want. You get, 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 get. That's their mentality. But in the culture of the kingdom, you give and you receive. 
Amen? So I want you to see so you can really understand if they have that picture. Do we have it? I think we do. Ah, okay, look, top picture. That is a mustard seed in somebody's fingers, in case you couldn't figure that out. The bottom <laughs> is what happens. <laughs> okay, so picture a whole acre of that and tons, a ton of mustard seeds. Can you imagine? That's what that produces in a short period of time when it is sown. So the kingdom of God takes that which looks small and it expands it because the culture of the kingdom is a giving culture. And it doesn't matter how much you have to give. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, God knows where you are in your status of life. He knows exactly what you can give and what you can't give. But everybody has time. Everybody has talent. Everybody has energy. And everybody has some money if you live in America. Amen? Okay. So the culture of the kingdom is giving. Say it's giving. But you have to be aware of what you are giving. Now, you could, you could sow a seed of a smile. Do you know that people, this time of year, they're not happy. A lot of people are not happy. They're sad. So you can sow smiles. You can sow hugs, if you're careful. <laughs> you, can <sow> a, <laughs> you can sow a kind word. You can sow a, a helping hand. You know, it always amazes me. If I'm out and somebody actually opens the door for me, or they help me if I'm carrying something heavy. It, it means so much to me because I don't see that happening so much in the world anymore. But they just sowed a seed and I always bless them with a harvest. And the harvest is going to come from the Lord. Amen? So Jesus sowed whatever the Father told him to, wherever he told him to. So you've got to be careful about where you plant. Where are you planting? Because what you sow into is what you're going to reap from. That's what the Bible says. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, whatever a man sows, is what they will also reap. Okay? So even what, whatever we have, whatever we're giving, whatever we're doing, you know that you can also sow a little bit of hatred. You know you could sow a little bit of not being kind. You could sow a little bit of withholding. You know, whatever you sow, that is what you're going to reap. And so, are you sowing where God wants you to sow, and are you sowing what God wants you to sow? So you have to, you have to start with understanding that whatever part of the kingdom that you are in, that is what you are going to bear fruit from. So it's either going to be the fruit of the kingdom of this world or the fruit of the kingdom of God. Amen? I want the kingdom of God. I'm going to be like Cindy. Let's vote for the kingdom of God. <laughs> That's exactly what she would do right then. <laughs> so we want to be sure to be sowing into the right kingdom. So God's kingdom works by Holy Spirit operation. Say it works by Holy Spirit operation. See how, see, I'm going to make you talk back to me. Okay, so the world's kingdom and its culture looks like this. They have behavior patterns. They're trying to get us to agree with their behavior patterns. They are constantly transmitting to our senses that it is not good to honor anyone but yourself. They are constantly saying it's about you. They are constantly... I, I watched this. I, I couldn't show it because I didn't agree with some of it, but... Um, someone sent a, a link to me, it, and it was Satan, and it said, if I was Satan, I would do this. And it showed all of the things that is happening in the world right now to steal away your faith. And if I was Satan, I would take prayer out of the schools. If I was Satan, I would make you feel like standing up for something is the wrong thing to do. You need to just cooperate with the largest voice. And so... The culture of the world has behavior patterns that they are trying to impose upon us. They're trying to make us have the same behavior patterns that they have, to compromise our minds, to, to take over what is right and wrong and make everything be okay. If everything is okay, where is right and where is wrong? 
And so if everything gets watered down and everything is just great, anybody could do anything they want to. That is why instead of putting gum underneath chairs in schools, they murder people. Because we let go of things we should have held on to. What we need to hold on to are the principles of God, and we need to speak them, and we need to present them, and we need to represent them. Amen? Amen. They have a belief system that's handed down as the new normal. Like, this is the way you should think. And all it does is glorify Satan's darkness. I mean, all it does is empower him. You're going to empower whatever kingdom you're agreeing with. So when I hear people who, who are saying things that I know is coming from inside of their heart and they don't recognize that they are empowering what Satan is trying to present, I just cringe on the inside and I have to pray because I'm like, you can't, you can't agree with the world system and get a heavenly response. Satan will answer your call, but you just, shut, you just hung your phone up on God. So God is trying to transform you to be a transformer in this world. Amen? Amen. All right. So um, it's a taking, not a giving culture. Okay. If you separate yourself from the world's kingdom and operate in God's kingdom, then the kingdom is able to operate with power, and it has lots of advantages. Aren't you excited about that? The advantages of the kingdom. So the characters of God's kingdom is directed by God, and it infiltrates your thoughts, and it will produce a harvest that will take you down the path where you really always wanted to be. We don't even recognize that sometimes we've been, we've been in a fog, and we don't, we're going somewhere, but we don't even know where we're going anymore. We're going after things that's going to make, put us on a path that we're going to end up where we don't want to be. But if you follow in the pathway of God's kingdom principles, you're going to end up on the path that you always wanted to be in, even if you couldn't say it. Because he is directing your path. Amen? So Jesus operated with kingdom authority and with wisdom. And so the Pharisees were always trying to trip him up. They're always trying to get him to say something or do something. And so this time, they come to Jesus with this question. And they said, um, who, who do we pay taxes to? And so Luke 20, 24. Jesus is so smart. He says, show me a denarius. That's the money of the day. Whose image and inscription does it have? And they answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He isn't saying, you know, rise up against the government. Do you know that he never did that? You know, Jesus didn't talk much about government. The only time he talked about government is when they made him. They put him in a position to. He was not upset about stuff. He just, because you know why? He was under the kingdom's government. And he knew it. And he said, but give to God the things that are God's. They couldn't trap him because he wouldn't operate in their kingdom. Okay, so listen, people. Satan can't trap you if you only operate in God's kingdom. Look at somebody and say, Satan can't trap you if you operate only in God's kingdom. Amen. You know, Jesus' taxes are going to be paid. They're going to be paid. But you know, his kingdom was out of this world. And so the way that he's going to pay his taxes is send Peter to go fishing. And that makes sense to no one ever. Okay, well, we got to pay our taxes. Okay, go fishing. And, get the, and the fish will get on your line. And it will have the exact amount of money that we need to pay our taxes because it's an upside-down kingdom. So whatever God says, if you have need of something, he's going to provide it. But he's not going to provide it the way that we think he should. We're not going to tell God how he's going to provide for us. He's going to provide in a supernatural way for a people who believe that he's supernatural. Amen? Okay, so... Jesus paid his taxes because he was living in this world. So if you don't pay your taxes, I'm just saying. Okay, Jesus even paid his taxes. So you need to obey the law of the land, 
but you never disobey the law of the kingdom. Amen? Okay, so Jesus was always thinking higher because we have to understand we live in our representative kingdom that makes no sense to this world system. It's not going to make any sense. So, but the kingdom of God will provide for us whatever we need. Amen? Amen. Okay, so Matthew 6.31 reiterates this. This is the benefit of living for the kingdom. Therefore, don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? He goes, don't worry about that. We spend so much time thinking about our bills and how, where we're going to get stuff and how things are going to get done. But he said, after all these things, the Gentiles seek. He's talking about unbelievers at this point. He's saying, that's what unbelievers do. They try to figure things out with their mind. But your heavenly father knows that you need all of this stuff. He's like, he's got a whole bag of stuff ready for you. He's better than Santa Claus. You know, he, he's already gone ahead of you and provided a way. He has everything you will ever need, and he's provided it for you. But he said this, next verse, but seek first the kingdom. Seek when? First. And what are you seeking? The kingdom. And his righteousness and all these things. Everything will be added to you. So let's, let's break it down. So what does seek mean here? What are we talking about? If we're seeking first the kingdom of God, we need to know how to seek. What are, what are we actually saying here? What is he saying to us? So seek here means to worship God. It means to worship him, to go about, to desire, to inquire for, and to require. So worshiping him, if you think about it, Jesus worshiped his father the whole time he was on the earth i mean he was always the example to us of how we should do things and he was always reverencing his father you know worship isn't just a song i like our worship i think we have awesome worship in this church and the presence of god comes every single time and we're so grateful for that but don't limit your worship to singing and don't limit it to worshiping him inside this building. Worship God with reverence, with honoring him, by obeying him like Jesus did. By requiring him as a vital part of your life. You know, worship is something that comes from deep inside you that you can't live without the presence of God. You're going to honor him. You're going to be with him. I mean, whatever time that you set aside for everything else, you need to set time aside to be in the presence of the king. If you want to be a part of the kingdom and what the kingdom is able to do for you, you need to worship the king. Amen? Okay, then righteousness. It doesn't mean right standing with God. Jesus had right standing with God. We have right standing with God. But here, righteousness means character and action. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first worshiping him. And then seek forth his righteousness. And that means that you have to do something about what you know. You have to take action like you've never taken before. And I know that that is, uh, like, listen, I, I had to take action today to be here. I had to take action against the enemy. I knew that when I started preaching this, there was going to be some stuff. You know what I'm saying? And so you have to decide. You have to decide, is this real enough to me? And so... You may be in a battle, but I know the victory is mine. Oh, yeah. Amen? You can walk in the victory if you know he's already won. I'm telling you, when, when trials come, and they will, when trials come, you have to live from the end yeah. to where you are presently. Right. He won the victory, so therefore we will have the victory, no matter what state we're in at the time. Amen? So think about Jesus and how he represented God's kingdom and how it changed the culture everywhere he was. So everywhere he was, the kingdom of God affected tax collectors. I think that's business, isn't it? Physicians. Wasn't Luke a doctor? All the religious folks. 
it re affected them. It turned murderers like Paul into lovers of God. He turned the natural into supernatural. Nothing was too hard for him. It redefined families. Jesus said, who's your mother and who's your brother? He's like, he wasn't excluding his mothers and his brother, his natural and the natural. He was including them, but he's saying, man, you're, you have to think kingdom. It's all inclusive. I mean, that's my sister, that's my brother, that's my brother, that's my sister, that's my sister, that's my sister, that's my brother. That's he said, change the way you think about family. It's all inclusive. We became a part of the family of God. And when we became a part of the family of God, we became a part of his kingdom culture. We, don't, we now are a body of believers that should move together to a fact the rest of the world people can't even get along with their natural families a lot of the time but you have to choose to walk in love amen okay so it's time for the body of christ to be aggressive king lovers aggressive lovers of the king amen that's who turns the world upside down the kingdom is an upside down kingdom so if you want to go up you have to go down but I love that when you do that, when you become a servant and you're no longer operating under the system of the world, the dynamic that happens is that it begins to transform the people around you. So in Acts 17, um, this is the accusation of just that. Paul and Silas came to Thessalonica proclaiming Jesus as king. And the people there said, the people in charge said, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And the rabbi was yelling at them saying, they, and they're saying that there's another king, Jesus. I want everybody to say that about us. There is someone else ruling over our territory. There is someone that has given us the rights to the kingdom, and it is Jesus himself. And so we're going to turn the world upside down. So whatever system, whatever kingdom that you choose to be a part of, you're going to determine how your life ends up being on your journey. Amen? Okay, so, all right, I'm going to close with this. Choose God's kingdom. Choose God's kingdom. <laughs> I need it, Cindy. Because it is a kingdom like no other. Psalms 145, 13. Your kingdom, God, is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures throughout all generations. What kind of kingdom is it? Yes. When did it begin? It always was. <laughs> you thought I was a trick question. <laughs> When did it begin? It always was. And how long will it last? Forever and ever. So you can be secure in that. Dominion means his government, his power, and his rule. It will operate. It always has operated. It's going to operate in the present, and it's going to operate in the future, and it's going to operate forever and ever and ever. For how many generations? All of them. So we have to understand the foundation that we stand on when we're living in the kingdom is the power of the kingdom, and he will back us with all of the power that he has. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, well, Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you that your presence came. Lord, I know people got healed, that we responded to your presence, Lord. I thank you for your word that is taking root in our heart that is springing up and it is making a marked difference in our lives so that we can be the transformation that other people need to see. We give you praise for that in Jesus' name. And the people said, amen. amen. Okay, I love you. <laughs> but who do we love the most? And who loves us the most? And who loves them the most? Okay, go be the light. Thank you for joining us today at Liberty Life Center. We hope you were challenged and encouraged by today's message. Visit us online at libertylifecenter.org where we have links to other archived messages and even a place to give. Be sure to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash libertylifecenter. We hope you'll join us again next week. In the meantime, embrace, display, and share God's love.